Today we're on shepherds and sheep, methods of form and function, part three. And we have spent some weeks, keep your hands up if you need something, uh, we have spent some weeks looking at the qualifications, the character, the responsibilities, the roles, the function, and the form of elders. Last week, we saw that elders are to protect the flock which God has placed under their care, and that protection will include all of these things. <laughs> Teaching sound doctrine, refuting false doctrine. Remember last week, anybody remember what we called false doctrine? We called it wolf theology. Remember that? Wolf theology. And so we're supposed to, the elders are supposed to refute wolf theology, and, and also discipline the flock when it needs it, or individual sheep as necessary. This week, we're going to look at a few more aspects of the work of the elder. And because there is not, as I mentioned last week, one passage that includes a comprehensive list of the responsibilities of the elders, we're going to be in several passages this morning, uh, but we're going to begin very, very briefly in 1 Peter chapter 5, where we have studied before. So go ahead and turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 5. And as you do, I want to give you an idea of where we're going in this series, Shepherd and Sheep, a look at biblical leadership. Today we're going to conclude our look at the leaders of the church, the elders. Next week we're going to look at what scripture tells us about the servants of the church, the deacons. And then we're going to conclude the last two weeks of this month as we conclude this series, we're going to look at the responsibility of the church to its leaders. As scripture tells us and lays it out. Uh, sometimes there are questions in, on, on what are these types of things that we're supposed to do and what are we not supposed to do and where does all these things fall. And um, reality, uh, if I can be um, unvague and very specific, God tells us all this stuff. All we got to do is open the Bible and listen to him. We get in trouble in churches, in life, when we don't know our Bibles and we don't obey what God says. And so we're kind of having a paradigm shift from what church culture is telling us is the role of leaders in church to what God is telling us he wants his household set up as. And so to be a biblical church, to be a God-honoring church, we only have one choice. Follow what God says, period. And to do that, we have to follow what God says. Take our own opinions out of it, okay? So this morning, we're going to conclude with looking at a, uh, some, a portion, a little more, of what the work of the elder includes. But before we get there, let's turn our attention to the throne room of the living God, worshiping him for even allowing us to enter into his word and allowing us to listen to his spirit, because that is a privilege that we take for granted too often. Our God and our Father, our great God, our Abba. Jehovah alone, God of eternity. Jehovah, the one, the great I am. You give us your word that has been breathed out from your mouth. What an honor and privilege to be able unlike centuries past, to hold multiple copies in our hands at one time, to even hold one copy in a language we can understand. It is a privilege to our generation. Let us be grateful for that, Father. Help us to learn to be grateful for your word. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to open it, to hear from you, and as your Holy Spirit guides us, directs us, teaches us this morning, we pray for both confirmation of what we know, conviction of where we must turn aside from what we believe to what you say. Transform our minds. Transform our hearts. Make us more like Jesus today. And now, Father, may the words of my mouth the meditation of my heart be pleasing and accepting in your sight. My God, my strength, my Redeemer. It is only through the cross, by the resurrection, and in the power and authority 
given to us because Jesus said to use his name and we can stand here in your throne room. We are ever so grateful. So upon his command, in his name, we ask, we plead, we worship. And together we say, Amen. By now, at this point in our series, if you've been following along, whether through being here week by week, or if you've missed something following along um, on the sermons online uh, by going to warsawbc.com and clicking on sermons, you can get there and watch those. By now, it should be no secret whatsoever that the elders should be shepherds. <gasps> Does that surprise anyone? It should be no secret that the elders should be shepherds. Let's go again to 1 Peter chapter 5. Therefore, I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God among you. Shepherding is a vital role for the elders. And, and an elder is entrusted, listen carefully, because sometimes we miss this. We think the elders just kind of oversee the church. Elders are entrusted with God's dearest and most costly possession, his children. Jesus was given in total, complete sacrifice for you and for me. For the church. You know, there's, there's two things. I, I don't know about most of you. I, I, I'm going to guess because I know some of you pretty well, especially the guys. But definitely in my house and with the gang I hang out with. Okay? We, we, you need to know gang I'm talking about. My martial arts buddies. There are two things in our lives you don't mess with. You don't mess with our wives. You don't mess with our children. Because ain't just one of us going to come at you. Yeah. <laughs> okay? I got a whole posse. I don't need them, but I got them. Okay? Some of them are older and they need us, but, but that's beside the point. You don't mess. How many of you would, would agree with me? Don't mess with my wife. Don't mess with my kids. Okay? Proverbs actually talks about that. So imagine the anger of God. Jesus Christ, when somebody talks about his bride, the church, in an unworthy manner. When, when we bicker and we are all at each other, and, and the church is infighting in and of itself and talks bad about another person of the church, think of how Jesus feels about that. Man, if I'm going to go after you for my wife, think about how Jesus is going to, you better, I mean, stay away from those people, lightning will strike. Okay? And I'm not talking about physical, it's going to happen in their lives. They will get disciplined. You know, how, how many of us in, in, in culture see uh, uh, people just attacking Christians? Scripture is clear. The wicked will perish. Part of the reason they'll perish is because they attack Jesus' bride. Why do they attack? Because they're not part of it. They're not part of the family and they don't understand how the family works. The bride of Christ Jesus bled, broken, beaten for. And we have the audacity to talk to each other in the way we do. And it is the shepherd's job to protect his sheep that God has given him and entrusted to him. So you can add a third one in my book. You go after those that God has entrusted me with, I'm coming after you. Period. I don't care if you're in the church, part of the church, or outside the church. Because it's my job. Now, how that going after gets taken, it may be start as a simple, we need to have a come to Jesus moment. You don't want to come to Jesus? Well, you're a sheep, I'm not you. Let's go to Jesus. You still don't want to go to Jesus? Okay. God has set up criteria on how to deal with those sheep. Or those who say that they're sheep and they're not. But that's Jesus' bride. Transfer that to God the Father and you attack his children. How many of you have been hurt by someone inside the church? Not necessarily archers, but in your lifetime. How many of you have been hurt by somebody in the church? Okay. 
How many of you have hurt somebody else inside the church, intentionally or not intentionally? Okay? We need to be careful. And when we are hurting others, we need to look in that mirror called the perfect law of liberty, the word of God, and ask ourselves this question. The same question Job, Job was asked by God. Who do you think you are? And we, we need to understand, if we would judge ourselves rightly, it would never get to another person to come alongside, whether it be another believer or an elder or a teacher or a friend, because we live in a role of understanding that God is God and we are not. I mean, just be thankful that some of us are not God, right? You attack, you attack my wife, you attack my family, you attack my sheep, you attack my students. God will give you thousands and thousands of chances. I'm working on number two for other people. Are we together on that? Don't look at me with that look. Some of you are looking on just, just letting go the first time. Okay, I'm on the second. All right, some of you, some of your mercies are way lower than mine are. All right, uh, God's, God's, God's moved me along a little farther. I'm at like seven points out of 25 of mercy. Some of you are still at two, so don't give me that look. All right? <laughs> Shepherding is entrustment with God's dearest and most costly possession. But to shepherd the flock of God entails oversight. And the, that, that is the overall supervision and the watchful care of the flock. We talked about this last week. The, 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 the job of the shepherd is he must lead, he must protect, he must feed, he must water. We, we covered all of these things last week. But when a shepherd does not oversee the flock, they are not a true nor are they a faithful shepherd. Now, we spent some weeks talking about this, but I think it's good that we're reminded the shepherding is not an isolated portion of what an elder does. It is an ongoing function that is incorporated into every thought of the elder's life, every deliberation of the elders, every action on the part of the elders. Shepherding is all inclusive into that. It is a serious, serious work, so much so that God has told the shepherds, you will answer to me and me alone for how you worked or did not work with my children that I entrusted to you. So therefore, wise and godly shepherds give time going before God in prayer, seeking his wisdom and his counsel about his household. Which brings us to the ministry of prayer. You're in, we're in 1 Peter. Hang a left in your Bible a couple pages to James chapter 5. James was one of the earliest letters written in the New Testament. So this is similar, although it's placed later in the New Testament. It's, we're really looking at this as kind of an uh, early mention principle. First, or James chapter 5, verse 13. Is any among you saw suffering? If somebody's suffering this morning, you say, mm-hmm. Got a couple of you, right? Then he must pray. Is anyone cheerful? You cheerful this morning? Give me a woo! -hoo. All right? He is to sing praises. Is any among you sick? If you're sick, go bleh. Okay? It says then, listen, listen what this says then. Then he must call for the elders of the church and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Now, we like to start picking that apart. Don't, don't get your eyes off your Bible for a second. Don't, don't start picking that apart, okay, because we're not getting into the theology of this this morning. That, that's a whole other issue. What we're looking at here is the prayer of elders. No work in the church is more important for elders than praying. Yet no work is more difficult when it comes to practice and devotion. You don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you would agree that your prayer life is not what you think it should be? How many of you would agree that praying, you really don't know 
how to pray and you have difficulty, that's why you don't like praying out loud. Again, you don't have to raise your hand. Part of the reason, church, that we don't know how to pray and we have difficulty in praying is because we don't give the time, the practice, the exercise, the devotion needed to prayer. It is a discipline of our spiritual lives. You don't get to play as a starter on a team if you don't show up to practice. Matter of fact, you probably won't be on the team long. Thank God he doesn't do that to us. Amen? You, 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 don't, you don't get to have the privileges of prayer unless you participate in the responsibility of prayer. It is the elder's job to spend time in prayer. But God's word is clear. He wants all men to pray. He wants all women to pray. It is a devotion that you should be incorporating into your life. You see, elders are not appointed by the Holy Spirit to be the firemen of the church, running to put out this fire, running to put out this fire, running to put out this fire. Elders are not appointed by the Holy Spirit to jump whenever the congregation says jump. Rather, elders are to devote themselves consistently to pray for the benefit and the blessing of the body. Is there any among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. So if you call the elders to pray over you when you're sick, the elders are supposed to bring anointing oil. It's like, well, that's just kind of weird. Kingdom culture is weird, folks. I mean, for crying out loud, we're called a weird people. You're a peculiar people. And there are reasons why, the, is, there, is there power in the oil? No. But there's obedience. There's obedience on the part of the elder to anoint. There's obedience on the part of the person receiving to submit. To the elder? No, to the word of God. Now, granted, it doesn't have to be a dumb one. Okay? It could be a quick little cross or something. I remember the first time I was ever asked to anoint someone with oil in prayer. I was guest speaking at a church up in Michigan. I was guest speaking and we were getting, I mean, I, the singing had been done. I was a guest speaker, so I walked up. I said, open your Bibles to us. Somebody said, Pastor? Yes? So and so sick this morning. Can you anoint them with oil? I'm sorry, I didn't bring any oil with me. Oh, there's some on the, on the shelf in the pulpit. You're right, there's some right down here. <laughs> Is that person here? All right, bring them forward. I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm just making this up and I'm going on like, my family, my dad's family's Catholic. I don't know. Bunk. <laughs> <laughs> No, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. <laughs> I didn't do that portion, but I, I did anoint. We prayed. I preached. I left at lunch and went home. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> but you know what? You know what they taught me? They were obedient to the word of God. Don't you do that during service. No. Which <laughs> brings me to a point. When the elders are not notified by you of your needs, they cannot pray effectively for you. Talk to the elders about your needs and write it down for them. Folks, the elders, every elder I've ever met that's a true shepherd loves hearing the stories. But you have to understand the importance of timing of those stories. Sunday morning is not, hear me carefully, is not the time to bring the business of the church to the attention of the elders. 
There are five other days, maybe even six in the week to do that. Okay? The rest of the week is the time, not during the time when their attention is fixed on what's going on in life groups and spending time in prayer and getting ready for the weekend worship celebration. That being said, right before the service is never the time to try and take your entire week's happening and condense them down to the few spare moments that you have right before uh, service and quite frankly, the few moments that the elders do not have. Right after the service, there are visitors to meet. Who's supposed to meet the visitors? You. Mm. Me. We're, all, we're supposed to do that. There's, there's multiple people who want to talk about something that the, the Spirit really impressed upon them because they came forward and they prayed they want to share what God's doing in that moment. There's many unknown things to the congregation that draws an elder's attention that elders cannot get into with the rest of the congregation. And, and, and it draws their attention, especially when someone is desiring salvation. That's not the time to step in and share your weak story with the elders. Now, that being said, you say, well, come on, that sounds really mean. All those things I just mentioned are things that take away the elders' attention away from the time they truly desire to want to give you and to your story. So help the elders meet your needs in prayer by taking the appropriate time and the appropriate method to contact them so they have the time to spend with you. There's a, there's a, a I'm going to tell you secrets that other pastors won't tell you. Why? Because I'm a little more open than most pastors are. Because I think it's necessary. If I don't understand how pastors and elders complain about stuff they're not going to tell their, their congregation, Right? I mean, is that fair? Okay. So, I don't listen to complaints from people who won't try to take care of the situation. I'm going to try to take care of the situation here. This is, I know this is going to be, this is, this is going to be very, very mind-blowing for you guys. There are six other days in the week besides Sunday. Mm. Do we know that? If your situation, your story is not important enough for you to ask for prayer during those six days a week, why is it important enough for the elder to take away from somebody who actually is looking at salvation or has a spiritual need to hear about your story in the few moments they have right after or right before the service? That's harsh. It's not, guys. It's, it's gentle to say... We want to give you the time that you need. But if it's not important enough for you to take the time, then it's really not that important, is it? That's like, that's like walking into the, into the grocery store and seeing your doctor and be like, oh, you know what, let me give you all my ailments right now. What's the doctor going to tell you? They're going to tell you make an appointment, aren't they? Why? Because they want to do all sorts of tests and get the insurance. I mean, um, uh, they're going to do all sorts of tests to help you get well. The same is true with your shepherds. They want the stories, but they want to do it in a way that helps you, not in a band-aid effect that has no ongoing health in your life. Are we, are we clear on that? So here at Warsaw Baptist Church, we offer multiple ways to connect with the elders. We have this blue thing in our bulletins called a... Connect card. We, we named it that on purpose so that we could connect. Yeah, we're, we, we're, we don't get all... We, we try to keep it simple for, for, for us who are stupid here, okay? You know, this this guy is standing up front. He got to keep it simple for himself. Otherwise, he won't remember how, what to call it. Okay, so if I want to connect with people, I got to call it a... What should we call that? Connect card. Okay, that was, that was, my, that was my brilliant uh, keeping it dumb for me. Okay? Why? So that when I go to print them in my computer, I can find what I actually named it. Because otherwise I forget. How many of you are like that? You forget things you name in your computer and you search for it and you're like, you know, so what are we gonna call these? Oh, let's call them connect cards. Oh, there it's under C. Boom, got it. Yay! Alright. So we offer that where you can request. Look, there's a whole pull out your connect card. Turn over the back. You see all those lines underneath there? A lot of them use them for prayer requests, and that is beautiful. Love it. 
But you can also put on there, hey, can we have coffee? Hey, hey, can, can, I, need, I, need to, I need to talk with you. Um, I'm going to email you this week, or I'm going to call you at the church, and uh, maybe maybe coffee's not long enough. Maybe maybe we're going to have lunch, and I'd love to pay for your lunch, Pastor. Okay? <laughs> uh, or you need to make, make an appointment to come in and, and have some privacy in your situation. Maybe it is writing down a prayer request. Maybe, maybe there's a not enough space there for you. Look at your bulletin. Turn it over. You see there's an email address on there? That's so that you can you know, have a, a long six-line email. Because more than six lines, people don't read them. We do. I'm just saying other people don't. So if we try to forward those on, they're not going to read that. So we'll try to condense that for you. Okay? And so there's a place to write down your prayer requests. There's emails so that you can uh, write fuller descriptions of going, what's going on in your life to request whatever you need. Folks, it's within and only by the ministry of prayer that the ministry of shepherding happens the way God wants it to. And if we only get a snippet of your life, we cannot minister effectively in your life. Does that make sense? Okay, I'll start over. All right, look at, look at James. Does that make sense? That we want to invest in you, but you need to help us help you. Okay? Speaking of investing, moving on. <laughs> Go to Acts chapter 11. You see on your outline there, we're moving on to the role of finances. This is a very, very, very diversive, or divisive, I should say, subject within the church when it should not be. Okay? So let me share some things with you. One of the reasons, and the primary reason, the role of the elders overseeing the finances is divisive in a church is because many of us, myself included, have seen time and again, both in our culture and in church life, the misuse, the misappropriation, and the wrong handling of funds by those in leadership. So let me just start off as we go through this. We're not going to spend a lot of time here, but I want to say this on the outset. Please, please, please don't take the sins of others and stamp them on God as if he got it wrong. Because he didn't. They got it wrong. Don't take the sins of others and stamp them on your current leaders as if they did it. Because they did it. By the way, in your personal relationships, and I'm dealing with finances, this is just bonus for you. Don't take the sins of where someone hurt you and expect that everybody else is going to as well. Okay? Who pays for the sins? Jesus. So it's not your job to take them anyway. Leave them alone. We see in 1 Peter chapter 5, and we've seen this again and again, that Peter calls himself a fellow elder. Peter does not refer to himself there as an apostle. Is, well, was Peter an apostle? Yeah. Yes. He was the main apostle to the Jewish nation. He was the lead apostle. But he was also an elder in the church in Jerusalem. He calls himself a fellow elder. And this gives even more adherence to bringing financial oversight into the role of elders. Why? Because in Acts chapter 5, which we're not there, we're in Acts chapter 11, same Acts chapter 11. But in Acts chapter 5, we have the story of Ananias and Sapphira. And everybody was bringing things in and selling their land. And they had a portion of land and they sold it. And they said they're going to bring it into uh, the church and give it. And they brought in a portion. They decided they were going to bring in a portion. And they laid it at Peter's feet. And Peter said, is this all there is? And they simply could have said, this is all we're bringing. And it would have been over. But Ananias said, no, this is the exact amount we sold the land for. And Peter says to him, you know what? When it was in your, when you had the piece of land, you didn't have to sell it. It was yours. You can do whatever you want with it. When you sold it and got the money, the money was yours. You were a steward of that money. You didn't have to bring any of it in. You could No big deal. But when you brought it in, you lied. But you didn't lie to us as the elders standing here. You lied to the Holy Spirit. And the wages of sin is death. And Ananias fell dead at his feet. A couple guys, three guys went out and buried him. They came back. And as they're walking in, Peter's having the same conversation with his wife, Sapphira. And she's like, oh, yeah. Yeah, that's all there is. Well, here comes the guys that uh, just buried your husband because he lied. They're taking you out too. Boom, dead, gone. Aren't you happy 
that in our quote unquote generous giving that we have week by week, we don't have the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. determining what our heart is in that moment for everybody to see as we either are exalted or fall dead in the, in the front of the church. Mm -hmm. I often wondered how many funerals would we have on a, on a weekend if the Holy Spirit killed us for lying to him. That's it, back up and go, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so here we are, and we're dealing with finances, and elders receive and administer the money and finances in the New Testament church. Look at Acts chapter 11. We just saw where it was early in Acts chapter 5. In Acts chapter 11, there's uh, Agabus who has come and prophesied in Antioch, said there's going to be a famine all over the world. And so, verse 29 of Acts chapter 11, the church in Antioch, in the proportion that any of the disciples had means, each of them determined to send a contribution for the relief of the brethren living in Judea. And they did this, sending it in charge of Barnabas and Saul. And they, Barnabas and Saul took the finances to the church at Jerusalem and gave it to the trustees. No. Well, that's not what it says? No. Oh, gave it to the deacons. Is that what it says? Gave it to the finance team. No. Gave it to the counters. Gave it to the treasurer. What's it say? Who'd they give it to? Oh. Say it, church. Who'd they give it to? What's it say in your Bible? The elders. Why? Because from the earliest examples of what an elder is supposed to do outside of teaching, preaching, and praying, we are given in Scripture that one of the main responsibilities of the elders is in regard to the financial dealings of the church. Now I want to give some quick thoughts here on the role of finances in the church. And we're not going to tarry long on this, but I think it's prudent for us to take a moment, set aside our own thoughts, our own ideas and realize what scripture is telling us is biblical. And so we need to think through this biblically. We know, we have seen this in our series, there are only two scriptural offices for the church. What are the two offices for the church that the Bible gives? The first is elders. The second is deacons. Okay, so we have the leaders of the church, the elders, and the servants of the church, the deacons. And we're going to look at that next week. One of the two should have the financial oversight. Well, that should fall on the leaders. Elders are bishops. The, the word's interchangeable. We saw that, didn't we? Bishop means overseer. So, if they're overseers, oversight or administration is implied in the term. And that includes in finances. Nowhere in the New Testament are elders told or are elders shown not to be involved in the finances of the church. In reality, we see time and again through the New Testament the exact opposite where they're required to oversee it. The church we've seen in, in 1 Timothy is referred to as the household of God. And we looked at the qualifications of the elders, and one of those qualifications is to run his own household well. That included the finances of his home. Why? Because it implies there's a responsibility of oversight in the finances of the church, and if you can't run your own home correctly in finances, you're not going to be able to run the church's finances. This next one, I, these next two, I believe, are very important. Because here's the thing, when we deal with finances of the church, I believe we look at it way too wrongly. We put too much emphasis on the finances of the church. Way too much. Your finances are not going to follow you into eternity. The church's finances will not follow her into eternity. And in addition to that, who owns everything in the earth? Church. God does. He specifically says, I own all the gold and silver. So spiritual maturity should be the driving force to kingdom dollars for a kingdom agenda. 
Just out of curiosity, how many of you, you don't have to answer this, but you'll get the point here in a moment. How many of you who have children, when you brought that sweet, ugly little thing home <laughs> from the hospital, had it in that car seat, he or she, I should say it, he or she in that car seat. <laughs> and the first thing you did was you took that, that, that wonderful baby and you set him right on the middle of the dining room table and your wife sat down and you sat down and you got out the checkbook and you said, okay, we're going to set up our budget now because we're a family and I need your input. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to the baby. No? No. No? Why? Because they're not mature enough to understand What's going on, right? How about your teenagers? Ever ask them how you want your household finances handled? <laughs> nope. No. How, how many of you who have adult children bring them into your home and say, hey, you know what? Let's, let's look at my finances and why don't you tell me exactly all my variables? I'm a financial planner as one of my other jobs and I still can't figure out everybody else's variables when they're giving me their stuff. Because people lie. Now sometimes it's by accident they forget things or they hide things on purpose. But the reality is you don't have immature children, you don't have babies determine your household budget, do you? So why on earth do we do that in the church? Why are the leaders standing in front and we have some spiritual mature people in the congregation. We have some spiritual adolescents in the congregation. We have some we have people all over, right? Newborn believers in the congregation. It's how a congregation is supposed to work. And we go, you know what? Here's the finances of the church. Why don't you now tell us how that should be worked? Does that make sense? Jesus, dealing with the issue of finances in Luke, said, If you've not been faithful in the use of worldly wealth, who will entrust true riches to you? Can you imagine somebody getting saved? baptized, next week is a church budget meeting. I got an idea. They, they haven't even been faithful yet because they haven't had time with any of their temporal things. How are we going to deal with kingdom agenda? Well, the, the pushback on this, yeah, I came prepared, folks. The pushback <laughs> on this is, well, but I give. You know, Ananias and Sapphira thought the same thing, thought they could control how the church finances should be told to work. Yeah. Not a good end for them. Now, I don't got the bus parked out to kill you. I'm just not saying that. That's not what we're talking about. Okay? But here's the deal. When we give, we cannot give with fists clenched. When you give, when you bring, when I bring, when all of us bring in our portion to the church and we give with open hands and we step back what we're doing when we're giving is you're relinquishing any authority and any control over what you give that you had before you had that you had before when it was in your pocket you're releasing it to God and God has chosen his elders to lead oversee and guide all things in his church and if you don't want to give cheerfully and you don't want to give with an open hand Friend, keep it. God don't Amen. need it. Right. Period. But don't you give with a closed fist. Because I guarantee you that God's open hand is a lot stronger than your closed fist. Elders are the God-appointed leaders of this household, his church. And they're going to be the ones who give the account to God for what took place, including the finances. And that's why plurality of eldership is so important. Because honestly, let's be clear, not every elder is going to have the same financial savvy as another one will. Okay? And so the plurality of elders allow the elders to work within the gifts and talents as they're accountable to the whole for the portion that they are overseeing as their role as a bishop. And that's why the plurality is so, so important. Well, that's all i got to say about finances. But that leads us straight into, when you're overseeing finances, there's leadership and decision-making that come with that. But it's not just within the financial realm. 2 Timothy chapter 2. I'm sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, 
Starting in verse 1, it says, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, re re rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. And they will turn away their ears from the truth, and will turn aside the myths. But you, be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Elders and those desiring to be elders must understand the agonizing frustrations, problems, and conflicts of the pastoral life are what God uses as his tools to mold the elder into the image of the good shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ. The humble servant character of elders never ever implies an absence of authority. The New Testament terms that describe the elder's position and his work, some of them are used, are God's stewards, God's overseers, the shepherds, the leaders, the bishops, and he gives what they're supposed to do, reprove, review, exhort with great patience, be sober, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist. Young man, fulfill your ministry by leading. Now, if you've ever been in a situation where you have had to follow a leader, it doesn't mean that you will always agree with that leader or group of leaders. And inside the church, you're not always going to agree with the leadership and the decision-making process. Let's just be honest for a second. Can we be clear? Most of us, all of us at any given time, don't even agree with Jesus' personal leading of us in our daily lives. Right? I mean, how many of us have argued with Jesus occasionally of what he's trying to do? So that alone proves that the sheep aren't the wisest people to, for the good shepherd to really work through. Except he does anyway, doesn't he? He, he? he uses the foolish things of the world to make them wise. Praise God. But the shepherds that God has placed in his fold as the under-shepherds, their job is not to ask the suggestions of the sheep. Y'all want to go grab something to eat? Yeah? All right. Oh, you want to go over there? You know there's a wolf pack over there, right? I understand the grass is green. It's because wolves don't eat grass. Uh-huh. I understand that. That's not good. There's the path that we always go on. Because for centuries, Jesus has taken us down. The no, we're not going over there. I said, we're not going over there. No, we're not going over there. I said, no. That's shepherding. We're moving this way. You don't want to go? You don't want to go this way? The rest of you follow me. We're going this way. That's shepherding. That's leading. That's decision making. And what happens is, 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 is when, when that, that when Bob finally gets over his little stubbornness because he's now munching on some, some good grindage of herbs and sweet grass and now he's happy because his stomach's full he forgot about the wolves. Bob, you want to go home? Yep. But the shepherd watches out for Bob because he you know Bob looks at where the wolves are. Where does this come in a lot of times? It comes in in doctrinal issues. In Acts chapter 15, as we kind of close out here a little bit, so you got another point. Yeah, it's short, I promise. In Acts chapter 15, we have a problem. We're not going to read through the whole chapter. I would encourage you to do that at some point. In Acts chapter 15, we have a problem. And what has convened is what is known as the Jerusalem Council. The problem is this. Some Jewish believers from Jerusalem went up to the Gentile church in Antioch and said, y'all need to follow parts of the law. And Paul and Barnabas and some of the leaders said, 
Uh-uh. Who are you doing that? Well, James sent us, and he said you have to. And Paul and Barb are like, what? Can you say anything last time we were down there? I think we're taking a road trip. Okay, so they got their combos, and they got their beef jerky, and they started heading down to Jerusalem. Okay? And they get to Jerusalem, and they present the problem to who? Well, are you in Acts chapter 15? They present the problem to the apostles and the elders. And then, when the case was made by both sides of what was going on, the apostles and the elders deliberated. They had a discussion. And at one point, Peter gets up as the, in the role of apostle and makes a suggestion. When he sits down, there's some more deliberations. And in verse 13, it says, after they had stopped speaking, James answered. And then he goes on and he gives this. And then in verse 19, he gives a decision. He says, therefore, it is my judgment that we do not trouble those who are turning to God from among the Gentiles. And then he goes on. He is the lead elder in the church of Jerusalem, and he makes a decision based on what the collaboration of the deliberation of the apostles and elders is done. But I want you to see the key. The key is here, he says, in my judgment. And in some of your versions, it says, it seems good to me. Elders take the information they have and make the best judgment they can. And sometimes we're wrong. But sometimes we're right. But we're always doing what God, from our perspective, what God is trying to tell us through the counsel of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and look at verse 22. He gives his decision. Verse 22 says that it seemed good to the apostles and the elders, comma, with the whole church, comma, to choose men from among them to send back to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. Don't read into this text. There is no vote that's taken. None. The apostles, look at how it's set up grammatically. The apostles and the elders gave the decision, and the church, the whole church, submitted to the decision that was given. Leadership and decision-making falls in the elders. The church is not a democracy. The church is not a republic. The church is a bastion of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the household of the living God. Mm -hmm. So we cannot run the church the same way the governments are run. Because the government of the church is a theocracy. God in charge. The head, Jesus Christ. So one last thing. It's not the last thing, but one last thing quickly that elders are to do is they're to counsel people. Look at Acts 21, verse 18. Following day, Paul went in with us to James. Here's James again, the lead pastor. All the elders were present. After he had greeted them, he began to relate one by one the things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they began glorifying God and said to him, You see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed, and they're all zealots for the law. But they've been told about you, that you are teaching all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children, nor to walk according to the customs. Was, was Paul actually teaching all that? N no. But there were in the church some people who were, well, if it was a youth group, they'd be the bad kids. Okay, they're stirring up trouble. Verse 22, what then is to be done? They're certainly going to hear that you have come. Therefore, elders speaking to Paul, do this that we tell you. You know what? They're telling Paul. Elders are telling an apostle what to do? Yes, they're counseling him. We have four men who are under a vow. Take them, purify yourself along with them, and pay their expenses so they may uh, shave their heads, and they will all know that there's nothing to the things which you, they have been told about you, but that you yourself also walk orderly, keeping the law. Did Paul have to do this? No. But concerning the Gentiles who believe, we wrote, having decided they should abstain from meat, sacrificed to idols, and from blood, and from what is strangled, and from fornication. Then Paul took the men, and the next day purified himself along with them, went into the temple, giving notice of the completion of the days of purification, until the sacrifice was offered for each one of them. He went along with the council. Why? Because he was able to write, I had become all things to all men, that so by some, 
Jesus Christ may be honored, glorified, and some get saved. And the outcome to this was not good. Paul was still arrested. Paul still went to Rome. Part of the plan of God, just because you get counsel and you follow the counsel, doesn't mean that your, your, your life is going to be a bed of soft feathers. Life's more like roses. Sometimes it smells good, sometimes you get pricked by a thorn. Because we live in an evil world. And so the counsel may be solid. It may be, it should be nuthetic, meaning it should come from the Word of God. There's a difference between advice and counsel. Advice is your opinion. And you know what they say about that. <laughs> counsel is based upon God's Word as its foundation. And elders need to give counsel. But when it's a matter that is not dealing with a specific matter in the Bible, you're going to hear a lot of times, well, this is what I would do, or it seems good to me, or in my judgment. And there's a difference. This is the best we have, but follow the Holy Spirit's leading. Friends, the work of elders is ongoing. It never stops. But it's a vital work that's, that, is, that is necessary for the health of the church. The elders' role is there to lead the church. As godly men continue to submit to Jesus Christ daily, they do the work that they're trained to do, equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. So, so what is the work that they do? It's the oversight of the flock. It's the leading of the flock. It's the shepherding of the flock. Each one of those has many moving parts within the function. <clears throat> the form is determined by the individual needs within any local church. The elders at this church should not have the exact same form form that happens in another church because, believe it or not, there's different people in another church. Okay? The elders must live and work in a way that honors Jesus Christ. And so as we close on this portion of learning about the elders' role, let me mention one last thing. It is not the elders' job to grow the church. It is not your job to grow the church. Jesus said, I will grow my church. As Jesus grows his church, the Holy Spirit will appoint elders to lead the church that Jesus is growing. Those who are desiring the office of a bishop, please, please don't ever try to take on the role of Jesus. There is enough in what God has already laid out in Scripture for the elders and the under-shepherds to do. You don't need to try to do Jesus' job. And friends, you can't. So church, listen to me. Do not put that pressure on your elders. It's not their job to grow the church. Jesus will grow his church. He already says he's going to. But he's going to do it his way to the local churches he wants. So let Jesus do his job. Let the elders do theirs, and you, friends, do yours. You may be thinking to yourself, boy, there's a lot that elders do that I never thought about before. Would you take the time daily and pray for the elders? Pray for the pastor. Pray for those who are leading the church, that number one, they stay teachable themselves. Maybe God's calling you into the role of elder, I don't know. It could be that you're today listening to, to what I'm saying and what all this actually means. But one thing you do know, something's missing from your life. Friend, let me be clear. Jesus loves you. Completely. There's nothing you can do that can cause him to love you more. And nothing you will ever do that will cause him to love you any less. You were created for a one-on-one -on -one relationship with God. And the God of the universe wants that relationship with you, and your soul cries out for that relationship with him. But maybe, maybe something is missing in your life, and you don't know how to fix it. Well, I got good news for you. You don't have to fix it. That's why Jesus died. That's why he rose again.